Were you born to be a rebel? Yanmitra Waddell is a strong advocate for victims and survivors of domestic violence. At 40, she instantly understood that she had to start being who she was born to be, a leader, a teacher, a trainer, a thought creator, and a rebel. Now, rebel or not, you don't want to miss this interview with the fearless woman, Jan Mitra. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Grant. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Grant. Anmitra is Amazon's international best-selling author of Fearless Woman Born to Give Thanks and Transition to Freedom, plus four other amazing books. She has received Author of the Year Award for two consecutive years and has had the opportunity to share the screen with the late actor Tommy Ford in the movie The Last Time. She is the founder of Be Fearless Inc., Waddell Consulting Services, and Bear Your Hair. She has an MBA in healthcare management and currently finishing her PhD. She is one incredibly busy and interesting lady. Welcome, Jan Mitra. Hey, Miss Carol, how you doing? I'm doing well. And you are going to be singing some of your words, I understand. <laughs> yes, I <I'll laughs> have it to sing some words. <laughs> oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay. Now, being fearless is what you're all about. And we're going to get into uh, that in depth. But this began when you decided to share your story with the world. And I personally know myself and hundreds of other people who have been in that same place where they had a step out and a lot of courage to share the story which they a lot of times have kept buried for many years and this is what you did you stepped out you had the courage to do it and now we're asking you if you would please share some of your story there especially the early years with us we all define it differently um and so i'll share my definition uh, with you guys as well and so part of my background like growing up I grew up in an abusive home and so for 13 years I saw my mother being abused and and Miss Kelly I was one of those kids that I swore I was like I'm never ever going to be in a situation I'm mm. never going to have anybody do this to me if anybody lays a hand on me I'm going to hit them back or I'm going to hurt them because I'm never going to be like my mother ever and, and I, then I was mad at her because I was like, how can you put your kids in a situation where we mm -hmm. are protecting mm -hmm. from our father? Like, that's a, that's a hard thing to concept to grasp at five. Like, why am I pulling on my daddy's leg so he doesn't stab my mother or he doesn't, she had broken legs, she had black eyes, you know, and she did the traditional things where you call the police and then when they get there, you change your mind and you don't. And finally, I remember having this conversation at 13, I think right at 12, right before I turned 13. Like, if you don't leave, I'm going to run away and I'm going to take my little sister with me. And I had, um, you know, back in the day, you remember my, I had my first typewriter at six and they, they used to come in a case. And uh -huh, uh -huh. my typewriter was my prized possession. And I remember taking my typewriter and hiding it in the back of my closet. So nobody would find it. And I and I packed clothes for me and my sister. 
because I was dead serious about leaving. Like if she was not going to leave, I was going to leave. And I was going to take my little sister with me. And um, I don't know, you know, I was a kid, so I'm not sure what the conversation was, but maybe a month later, my grandfather showed up in, in the middle of the night while my father was at work and, you know, helped us pack. I didn't need any help packing because all of my things were already packed. <laughs> I grabbed like a few toys. <laughs> all of my things are already packed. Like, Ma, I'm ready. And so, you know, we moved to the next city to, to live with my grandfather. Uh, and we're from a small town. So the next city is literally 20 minutes away. But but it was a different world because it was the country and I lived in what they considered the city. So I went from, you know, city living cables and all the things to living in the country where he didn't believe in air conditioning. There was no cable. There was no the highlight of your day was the mailman coming. And, you know, you were 20 minutes from the closest anything. And so my life began to transition there. But I was I was definitely one of those people where I was a firm believer I was not going to live this life like there was no, how could women live this life and I was not going to be the one who did that and little did I know that you know a few a few years later I'd be married directly into that uh, into that very thing and why do you think you did that like in hindsight do you think you were looking for somebody which they often say girls of abusive fathers do they look for what they knew to be their comfort zone their their reality and, you know, that's such a hard question because I'm not sure. I will say it wasn't what I was looking for because, and then let me preface this, by the time I met my ex-husband, I was 25, my father had completely changed his life. And so we all had a great relationship. I forgave him, you know, it was a lot of work that you don't realize you have to do. And so I had a great relationship with my father by the time I was 25. And then I was introduced to this man who he is the sweetest, nicest, most articulate person, most well-dressed can sing. He has sung for President Clinton and Carnegie Hall. Like he has done all the things and none of that was present at the time. Um, and so the first time he hit me, I was in total shock. And, but then the apologizing that came out, like, I'm sorry, I was just really scared that um, you were gonna leave me. And in my mind, it, it, it didn't click. And he was like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, okay, but you have to promise me you're never gonna do this again. And I told him, I was like, because I don't date men who abuse women, that's not what I do. And I, and I had a five-year-old daughter at the time. And I was like, I don't do this. He was like, I wouldn't expect you to. You're raising a daughter, you know, it's not fair to her. And, you know, and then we went on about our, our way and my daughter and all of her genius at five said, mom, please don't marry him. He's not a nice man. And I'm like, oh, he is a nice man. You don't know what you're talking about at five. Wow. And little did I know that, you know, kids know way more than, That's than right. we ever will know. Yep. There came a time, though, that you chose to leave him and you had a three month old preemie. Yeah. You had a seven year old. And he cleaned out your checking account, he cleaned out your savings account, and you found yourself in a shelter. So take us a little bit down that road and, and share with us what happened. We were married two years. <clears throat> and when we got married, he decided that, you know, I, I come from a very close-knit family. And so I saw my mother and my aunts and my sisters every single day. We normally had dinner together. We talked on the phone all day. And so he felt like I was too close to my family. So he packed us up and moved us 340 miles away to the other side of the state. And so for two years, Miss Carol, I didn't see my family. Um, most of my time was spent locked up in a room. If he let me go to work, I only worked when he told me I could. Um, and so the abuse started there from eating once a day, using the bathroom once a day. I was going to talk to my oldest daughter. And then, of course, we had a baby who came two months early and I wasn't allowed to take care of her. Because he made it very clear that my job was to train the new wife that he was going to marry because he was going to kill me. And he tried Oh, well, you can't be serious. <laughs> yes. He tried on several, on three different occasions to kill me. And the last time he almost succeeded. And I was like, I, I, I've got to go. And not only that, we had moved an additional hundred miles away. So now I'm at the coast of North Carolina. 
and my family is in the mountains of North Carolina. So I'm almost six hours away from them. Still haven't seen them. I have a newborn that I can't nurse. I can't touch. I don't hold her. And the, the day I left, so the turning point, and I call July 26th as my freedom day. That's the day I celebrate my freedom. Um, he had sodomized me in front of the newborn. And I just remember laying there thinking, I hope you just absolutely never remember any of this ever in your life. And after he had done his business and I was like, can I please go take a shower? He was like, no, you can't. He then, Miss Carol, got on the phone and we were in counseling and he called our counselor and told her that I'd had a mental health breakdown and he was afraid for his safety and for the children. He was afraid I was going to kill him and the kids and he wanted to have me committed to a mental hospital. Because it was the weekend was the only reason that lady did not have me committed to a mental hospital. The next morning, um, he normally didn't sleep because he had sleep apnea. But that night, he had taken um, two of his sleep apnea pills and he was dead to the world sleep. When the phone rang at 7 a.m., when the phone rang, it was a former church member. And I just broke down and I cried and I just told her everything. And I think we all need a friend who's like your advocate. That's right. And Yeah. And who... You know, she cusses and she doesn't care. And she she was like, if you don't leave right now, I'm calling the police. And I was like, you don't understand if I leave because he'd already told me, you know, if you leave and you take my children, I will never stop hunting you down until I find you and I will kill you if you ever leave and take these kids. And I knew once I opened up the front door that the door was going to say door open. And I stood in front of that door for 30 minutes. My oldest slept downstairs. And the rule was he didn't think she was good enough to live in a, to live on the same level of home that we did. So she had to live on the bottom level. And I went downstairs and I was like, grab your favorite toy. And I went upstairs and I got the baby. I changed out of my pajamas because I was going to leave in my pajamas. I put on a T-shirt and a pair of jeans and I went downstairs and I held that phone and I cried. I had a diaper bag that had three diapers, a bottle of milk and a seven year old and, and a a cordless phone in my hand. And I told my oldest, I was like, when I open this door, I want you to take off running. I don't care what you hear. I, you just keep running. Don't look back. Just keep running. And I opened up that door and we took off running across the, the front yard. I With the uh, cordless phone still in my hand, <laughs> a baby in, you know, car seat in my arm. And I literally threw the baby in the back seat. And I told my oldest to hold her and I took off. And this Carol, I took off in a car. It was a red neon. It had it only held three dollars worth of gas. The front wheel would fall off if you went over 50 miles an hour. It had no tag, no insurance, and no registration. I got maybe two miles down the road and I got pulled over by the state trooper. And I was like, oh my God, how did he find me that fast? And so I get out the car hysterical and I tell the state trooper what's happened and uh I guess he believed me because who can be that hysterical, right. you know, and make that up. Mm-hmm. And he was like, just, he was like, just go, just be careful. And that $3 worth of gas in that gas tank took me over a hundred miles to the next city. And it was there that, um, I, I didn't want to go to my friend's house because I knew he would know that would be the first place and the only people I knew to go to first. And so I found myself in a shelter with, with two kids. And it is a very humbling experience to say to another adult, can I have some underwear? Can I have a toothbrush? I don't have a comb. I don't have undergarments because I literally left with the clothes on my back. I had nothing. And the next day, you know, they let me stay. And the next day I went to the bank because I was like, oh, I get unemployment. That'll be some money. And when I got there, well, this is the same day. After I checked into the, the, the shelter, I went to the bank and this is when there was a Wycobia <laughs> and I went to the bank and I said, I wanted to take some money out of my account. And they was like, oh, well, Miss Waddell, there's, there's no money in your account. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, oh, well, Mr. Waddell closed your checking and your savings <laughs> this morning. I oh, was like, Lord. what? And. And so by this time, my, the friend that I was, that was with me, she called and he was like, I want you to tell you, Mitra, I miss her. I miss her and the girls and I know they need some things and I want to make sure that they're well taken care of. So they need to come home. How can I be well taken care of when you cleaned out our bank account? And he didn't work. So all the money was my money. <laughs> oh. so 
you're laughing about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was my job to work and take care of him. Because, you know, he was the pastor of the church. And so his job was just to be the pastor of the church. It wasn't his job to work. And so he, you know, he took my money and I was just devastated. And it was, you know, that began my journey from 2004. It's been 17 years now. And uh, every day, you know, and most people, when you first leave, you know, your mindset is just chaos and crazy. And it took me a while. So I had a kid. I never, and, you know, giving birth to a child, I almost died. So I didn't see her for two weeks after I had her. And there was no connection. So I have a newborn this care that I have no motherly instinct for. So I have postpartum depression. I'm already depressed. I'm in a shelter. I got two kids. My family's 400 miles away and I have no money. And it, I'm like, it doesn't get any worse than this. And my friend finally she convinced me to say, you know what? You can't stay in the shelter. Come stay with me and my husband. I have an extra room. You and the girls can stay there. And it, if it had not been for her, I don't know how I would have taken care of myself because I could not touch that baby. And I had a seven-year-old that was dependent on me and my days were spent in the bed. I, I spent the days in the bed crying. And if the baby would cry, I would cry. And luckily, you know, she she would wash my child. She would give her a bath. She would change her. She put her in daycare. She did all the things that I physically, I just could not mentally handle in, in that moment. And, you know, she was she was definitely a lifesaver for me. And it was in her house that I started to take those little bitty steps to, you know, to do things differently. Along with all the abuse and everything else that you just described, which is horrendous, you also were dealing with guilt. You were also dealing with fear and you yes. were dealing with depression. So you were emotionally drained and compromised as much as you were in every other way. Yes. Now we're going to take a short break and when we come back, this is just a 30 second break because I know the audience is on the edge of their seat right now with what happened. When we come back, we're going to not only share the other side of this story, but the aha moment when you realize that you do not have to be a victim of your past. And I know that this is going to appeal to many members of this audience who have been through similar experience as yourself and possibly going through something right now that they really need to switch gears. So we'll be right back after this short message. Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast-paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering, or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never, ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. has just shared this phenomenal story of how she went through such an abusive situation, a hopeless situation. And yet here she is today, as I explained in, in the initial uh, bio that we gave, she is a successful, bright, giving woman who has written books and has had many life experiences of not only making herself a better person but of course helping others do the same thing. So let's pick up where we left off. Was there that aha moment when you realized that you needed to do some changing or what happened there and then proceed? I had two aha moments of course with the, the first day that uh, July 26 when I, I first left and then the second one came, uh, well, I'll say there was a couple. The second one came with a quote that I read that I wrote on the back of an envelope. And because I'm a nerd and I love the library, and that's one of the things that I couldn't do was read books and go to the library. Like, how can you take that? I would read three or four books a week. And I'm the type of nerd that I'll have to smell the pages. Like, I, I love the books. And so the first place I asked to go was to the library. And she took me there. And I have no idea what book this was. But I opened it up and there was this quote by John Wooten that says, 
Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. I wrote that on the back of my envelope. I have no idea why. I And I just knew it was in my purse. And then one day, my other aha moment came when I was just scrambling. Like, I, I didn't know the next right thing to do. And, and I'm like, nobody... And I hate when people give you uh, philosophical advice or religious advice that says God will fix it. It's going to be okay in the morning. And they give you these general statements. I didn't need general statements. Yes. I needed Jojo today at this second. I want you to go do this tomorrow. You will do this. I needed somebody to tell me what to do because I didn't trust my thoughts. I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust myself to make any decision at all. And in that moment, as I was digging through my purse for something, that envelope was there and it said, don't let what you don't know interfere with what you do know. Wow. And I was like, oh, so that's what I'm supposed to do. And that was, and by this time I had a job, I was working at IBM and Miss Cow was making a whole $12 and 26 in an hour. And I was not able to pay my bills with $12 an hour with two kids. I was taking gas out the lawnmower to put it in my car. I, there was days I couldn't go to work because there was no gas. I didn't eat because I needed the food for the kids or I washed clothes in the bathtub because we had no washer and dryer and there was no money to go wash clothes. And, and I'm struggling in that moment. And, and my abuse, my ex abuser had made my life such a living hell because when I left the abuse didn't stop. He reported me missing to the FBI. He said, I kidnapped the children. So here I am having to explain my story to the FBI, to the police um, he then reported that my child had been sexually molested. So I'm having to explain to a seven-year-old why she has to go to a special doctor to have an exam done because of the things that he said. Yes. And uh, I'm in the midst of all of this. And you throw in court and I couldn't find any attorney to represent me. And this is when this quote came in. I was like, there's no attorney that wants to represent me. Nobody wants to help me. What am I going to do? And then I read that quote. And I was like, oh, well, Jojo, you had two degrees before you met him. So you're not stupid. Like he said, you're not dumb. You can read and you can research. And that was my aha moment. I, oh, that was my really? year, <laughs> that I began to research the laws of North Carolina. And I learned everything I could about domestic violence, represent yourself. And I love to tell people that you need a color story in your life. And my color story was me putting that quote into action because the first time I went to court, I cried. The sheriff deputy literally picked me up and carried me to sit beside the judge to tell my story because I just knew he was going to bust in the door and kill me at any moment. And the second time I went to court, Miss Carol, pink is my least favorite color ever. <laughs> um, I, I could wear any color in the world other than pink. But I knew I had to do something drastically different. So on that second court day, I went to, I couldn't afford the shopping store. So I went to the Goodwill. I got a hot pink suit, the shirt with the matching <laughs> hat. I found some hot pink shoes. I got some hot pink lipstick with some earrings. And I went marching my little self into that courtroom with that quote firmly in my hand. Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. And I went in there and the judge was like, well, Miss Waddell, <laughs> you're totally different than the last time I was <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> Let's go. And me putting myself outside of my box. And, you know, yes. It, yes. Real, it, it was like, yes, Jojo, you can do this. And I represented myself against him. And he was, of course, my ex-abuser was in total shock. Like, who was this woman? He didn't know what to do. Of course, I won the case. The judge uh, the, you know, he was like, you sure you don't want to go to law school? You sure you haven't thought about that? I was like, no, sir, but I can't wait to get home and take this hot pink clothes off. But, you know, and so I encourage everybody to get them a color story and um, just to step so far outside of your box that there's nothing that's impossible for you when, you know, when you put it all in. And, and in that moment, that quote came to life for me. I focused on what I knew. I knew I could read. I knew I already had two degrees under my belt. So I wasn't slow. I wasn't stupid. And if I just did what I know I needed, I could do everything else would fall into place. And, and it absolutely did. So um, let's just back up here for one second. So did he find you? Cause you said he, he, he was in court. So did he find you or did you have yes. to co the court contact him? He found me. So um, the first time we went to court, uh, he didn't know where I was. He didn't even show up for our very first court date. He didn't show up. 
the by the time my second court date came along, and I had now mind you, I've been to counseling, I've done everything that the counselor has told me to. I, I different ways home. I made sure nobody was following me. I did all the things. And I woke up on the, the, the girls are two, uh, two days apart. They're seven years and two days apart. And I woke up on the oldest birthday and she was like, mommy, can I go ride my bicycle? And I'm so protective. Like I never let them outside. I like, you, there's just not a lot they can mm-hmm, do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's your birthday. Y- you know what? Yes, you can go ride your bicycle. I'm getting up. I'm going to open up the curtains and I, I can see you from the, you know, the living room. And she comes back to my bedroom. She's like, mommy, there's a note on our door. I was like, what? She was like, it's from daddy. It says, happy birthday, girls, from your daddy. When I tell you, my stomach dropped and I called the police and I just could not believe that he, like, how did he find me? Like, how did he find me? And I still don't know to this day how he found me. He found me and I left. I left the home and I stayed with friends. And by this time, um, Child Protective Services was involved because they told me that there was a sexual allegation against um, against her, my youngest daughter. And she told me, she was like, it's against the law for me to tell you this, but I'm so afraid. She's like, your ex-husband told me all these things and I don't believe him, but I think he's going to kill you if you stay in his home. And so I sent my girls to, to stay with my mother for like two weeks. And then I was like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of running. I don't want to run anymore. And I went and picked up my kids and I came back home and I stayed in that house. And a month later, we went to court. And that's when I had on my hot pink clothes. And I, I just stopped running from, from that day forward because of, well, this is what I knew. He tried to kill me three times and he almost succeeded that third time. If he wanted me dead, he had every opportunity to kill me. Why did you leave a note on the door? Why didn't you come in and kill me then? And that let me know he he wasn't going to do that. He just wanted to, you know, be the bully and push right. himself around. Yes. And he wasn't yes. going to follow through. And I was like, I'm, I'm, t- I'm done. I'm not running anymore. <laughs> no. Wow. That was another aha moment. Now, there was a point, getting back to that aha moment, when you decided to start being who you were born to be. Explain that. I have a quote that um, I love, um, and it's by, it ain't mine, it's by Brianne Brown. She says, either you want to stand inside of your story and own it, or you want to stand outside of and hustle your worthiness. And I got tired of explaining myself. And a lot of people, in, in all of their helpfulness, they don't realize that you could be hurting someone that you're trying to help. Because they will say stuff, girl, it couldn't be me. I'm, you know, he knew the right person to hit because if he would have hit me, he knew I would have killed him. And when you say that to someone who, whether it's mental, emotional, physically, whatever you're going through, it lets that person know right then and there. I can't trust you with my feelings. I can't trust you with what I'm going through. I can't do any of that. And I was tired of holding it all in. I was tired of making excuses of, but Jojo, why did you stay? And I finally said, you're never... You're never going to understand because you've never been there. So you can't tell me what you would do. If exactly. You in my shoes. Yes. You, you have no idea what that is like. And, I, and it was me standing up for myself because I was the girl who I did all the right things in school. I made the good grades. I played the sport. I did everything in church. That I did everything you told me to. I went to college. I was the senior class president. I played soccer. I mean, I did everything I was supposed to do. And I never question anybody. And then I, I go through this horrific thing. And I'm like, but I'm a good person. Why is this happening to me? And then at 40, I realized I've got to, this is not it. I can't keep explaining my life away and living it for somebody else. This is exhausting. And I don't want to do this anymore. And I put my foot down. And that meant I stopped talking to people. I told my family, I love you, but I'm, I'm not going to talk to you for like a week or two. I will text you, but I'm not physically going to talk to you. And, and that's what I did. And I just took time to be with Jojo. Jojo's my nickname. And I just took time to, you know, to be with me, to see what I wanted. Cause I was always checking and asking whatever, you know, the job, what do you need me to do? The kids, what do you need me to do? My mother, my sister, you know, I was always checking to see what they needed. And not once did I check to see what I wanted, I was exhausted by the end of the day. I was meant like I couldn't, I had nothing left to give. There was not an ounce left in me. And that's when I decided, you know what? I'm about to rewrite all of this story. 
<laughs> I don't know what the end's going to look like, but I'm rewriting the story and it's going to start today. So obviously this is what you're recommending to people to do as well. So now take us to the next step and share how we can stop apologizing for who we are perceived to be. And there had to be a, that another aha moment when you realize that you could help other people in this. Yeah. Share that, please. So the first, the first time I knew that maybe my story could be something different, um, I was I was working at this hospital and a lady came in and, and she said she was with an agency and they help people get off welfare and, you know, go back to work. And some of these young girls have been abused, blah, blah, blah. And when she leaves my office, because I was the hiring manager at that time, and when she leaves my office, I was sitting there thinking, wow, I remember that was me because I went through one of those programs. I had to go through one of those. I, I was on welfare. I had to go through the work, you know, and I'm like, why am I having to do this? I have two college degrees. Why am I having to go through this program? And I was embarrassed, but I also understood that, you know, I had to go through that. And I was like, wow, maybe there's somebody like me in her program. And I promise you, Miss Carol, I got up and I took off running down the hallway. Um, and I, I had to run through two floors to get to the front of the hospital to stop her before she got to the parking deck. And her name was Miss Catherine. I was like, Miss Catherine, I, I said, I, you know what? I would love to come and talk to those young ladies. I was like, I've been in that position and I would just love to come yeah, in to share my story. Wonderful. And never, I've never shared my story in my life. And then when I show up that day, I called out of work sick, <laughs> showed up that day <laughs> to talk to these young ladies. I shared my story and I was so nervous and scared. And it wasn't until after I left there. And a little girl reached out. I call her a little girl. She was like 20, 21. She was like, had you not came and told that story that day? And she was like, you wasn't dressed up like normal people were. You were in jeans and a T-shirt and you talked just like me. You told and explained how I'm feeling. She was like, I would have stayed with my abuser. I would have not known that it doesn't matter how hard it is. Wow. I can do something different. And that was when I, I cried all the way home. I was like, OK, so now I know that. Whether I like this or not, I've got to share this story. It happened for a reason. Whether I want to say it did or it didn't, I'm in this position for a reason, and I've got to use my voice. Now, let's fast forward to what you're doing now as an advocate for victims, of course, but also your books and your speaking engagements and everything, what do you have that you are contributing that people can tap into to change their lives and, to, and their mindsets? So now uh, I'm, the, I'm uh, trademarked as the only live past crazy specialist because, you know, who better to tell you how to live past crazy than somebody who's been knee deep in crazy? And, and so I talk to, you know, and, and then I tell people that your crazy doesn't have to look like my crazy. Like, you don't have to have all the drama that I have. Of course, your crazy of course. Crazy. You know, you just have the kids and you have the husband and the job and you, have, and you just have all the things. And how do you even start? Like what is when you're between a rock and a hard place and you can't drop anything like you can't stop moving forward because everything will drop and you can't stop because everything will drop. What do you do on that day? Like when it's so crazy, you just don't know what to do. And so I have five keys to live past crazy. And number one is to be quiet. Um, because we are always going and you're always figuring it out and having the answer for everybody but you. And so number one is to be quiet, lock yourself in a bathroom. That's my favorite place to be. Lock yourself in a bathroom and you stay there and just be quiet. No phone, no book, no nothing. And allow you to talk to you and to reintroduce yourself to yourself. And, mm. you know, you just be quiet. And in that being quiet space, you will find that there's there's somebody there that's been talking to you for a very long time. You just didn't trust it because you made bad decisions or you've been in a haste to make decisions. But if you just allow that person, and I'm a firm believer that, you know, I call it your knower. It has always been calling your attention, but you, or every day, and people say, well, Jojo, I'm not you. I can't do this. This is hard. And they said, I'm not powerful. Let me tell, I like to tell people, this is how powerful you are. You are so powerful that every morning you get up, you tell God, I refuse to believe that you have anything good in my life. You override the God that's inside of you to focus only on the negative. You do that purposefully every day. 
every day you use your power to say, I can't do this. I'm not smart. I'm not good looking. I'm fat. You, you use all of your power to give everything negative power in your life. You use that every day. So just imagine if you just took some of that power and redirected it to the right. positive, to the negative. Because you're, you're always arguing for your limitations. Every day you argue for your limitations. Like, I can't do that. And, and you try to convince other people. And that's how powerful you are. And so between the books and the speaking, we talk about how to live past crazy, the new rules to the new you. Uh, we talk about team abundance. And we talk about how you're um, with women. I, I host a retreat called um, Sister Rise. And Rise stands for revitalizing individual sacred energy. How do you recognize that your energy is yours? Like everything that makes you Miss Carol, everything that makes Jojo Jojo, how beautiful that is and how protective you got to be over that. And when you're protective over that and you learn to receive well for yourself, then you can give more. People say, oh, I'm a giver. I just want to give and help. And I think we got it backwards. We need to receive more before I can give. I can't tell you if I'm giving to you, I can't show you how to receive from me if I've never learned to receive for myself. And so, you know, receiving for yourself looks like resting. It looks like learning the five keys to live past crazy. It looks like the first step is changing your mindset and believing it above any and everything else. Receive that first. And then when you're ready to give, you have an abundance. You have an overflow of, of giving. And then you're you're never without uh the energy to give to give to those around you now is your book or one of your books or memoir as well or are these all yes. self-help books so the first two books are completely about my life so fearless woman born to give thanks and transition of freedom is everything about my life so when i wrote book one miss carol everybody's like oh jojo you have such great imagination <laughs> that's how i went author of the year they was like, how did you come up with these characters in this story? I said, I did. That's my life. I did. <laughs> they was like, oh, what? And so when Transition to Freedom, which is my transition, you know, into okay. freedom of myself, okay. um, came out. That's when I won Author of the Year, you know, for autobiography. They was like, oh, and then because people truly didn't believe me, that's when I put actual court documents in there. Oh, my goodness. That's a good idea. Expertise. Yes. Yeah. So that people could see you know, that this is real because, you know, people, they're going to believe what they're going to believe. Yes. And, you know, that's up to them. I, I can't change that, but I can give you the truth. And, you know, this is the truth and this is what it is. So, and then the other books are on leadership, um, depression, how to get past postpartum um, and, you know, how to step your way out of depression one thing at a time. And so all of these will be on the notes from this show with the links on Amazon, etc. Do you also do any coaching or is it strictly like your retreats? I do coaching. So we have, I just started a program called Team Abundance. And our theme is we will be excellent. We will not quit. And we are going to persist. And, and this is also on your website? Yes. Uh -huh. This is on, on okay. the website. So Team Abundance is just all about mindset and how you uh, integrate that into your everyday life and how, you know, people say there's positive patties. How do you really become a positive patty and deal with the, you know, you got to deal with the ugly stuff first. And, you know, so that when you want to be positive, you can truly step into that altogether. Well, you certainly are someone who has walked the walk. And I think that, like you said, some people don't even want to believe the story, which is not unusual when you do have a, an extremely rare, unique story, which I'll take that back because all our stories are unique, Absolutely. but some of them are a little more unusual than others. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, yes. I liked what you said too, in that it doesn't matter what you've gone through, just like that that woman that you know that first time that you spoke and how she could relate and and gain the strength of how to leave her abuser it doesn't matter what you've gone through we all can relate on different terms and so you have a lot of resources here that we're going to be able to share with the audience of how whether they've been abused or not they still can relate to their inner self and how to 
do some of the things and come out of that shell that they have always wanted to do. So I really appreciate that. And I know that our time is running tight here, but we did want to hear your story. And we definitely want people to tap into all of these resources and connect with you. You have so much to offer. You're a fantastic storyteller. And I sincerely appreciate that. Now, there is one last question that I have for you, and that is your time on the big screen with Tommy Ford. You must share that. So um, it, let me tell you, that was so exciting. And you never know. Let me tell you, I've always, you know you know how you grow up and say, I want to be an actress. You never know really how much work it is. Like one scene literally takes two to three days. Like you look <laughs> right. at the camera, your bracelets are dingling. I was like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> Um, but it, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. And so the movie is called The Last Time. And it was uh, actually on TV. Um, it's on Aspire. It has been on Lifetime, I think, um, a couple of times. And it's about a police officer who abuses his wife and how um, she gets out of that abuse. And so my part is simply um, as her part of her support system. She comes to, you know, a survivor support system and we're there to help her along her journey. And it was just amazing to see, you know, to be in a room with people who do this for a living. And you're thinking like, who am I? I'm just a girl from North Carolina. Like, who am I <laughs> to be in, in, you know, in the same space as these giant people? And, it, you know, it was just an amazing, an amazing experience. And that was the last movie that he did before he passed away. And so um, just to, you know, that you had the opportunity to work with somebody. It was just, you know, it was just great. And. I, I appreciate every moment of it. Well, that just kind of came full circle for you, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jan Mitra, for being on Never Ever Give Up Hope. You certainly should be the poster child, the poster girl for the show. <laughs> because, <laughs> because no matter what abuse you were taking, you never gave up. And now you are using your past to help someone else with their future. And that's what this show is all about. Standing with uh, uh, you know and understanding what you had gone through so you can help someone else and I really appreciate that and I thank you so much for being on never ever give up hope thank you Miss Carol I appreciate it. I had a great time you had some great questions so thank you so so very much I enjoyed it thank you for listening to never ever give up hope featuring Carol Graham did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.